It's episode 50 of the Canadian Ed Leadership Podcast show. That's, I think that's significant. I'm very pleased with the way this podcast has gone and what I've learned. And my goals were always to highlight Canadian leaders, the diversity that we see across the country from province to province and similarities, the differences, all of that. And just again, to maybe even encourage people to say, wow, we have some tremendous people doing the hard work and doing it well. And so what I want to do in this 50th episode is create a bit of a highlight reel. We're going to start as far east as we can, which technically should be Newfoundland. And I'm still working on, I do have somebody that I think I can bring in from Newfoundland. I have not got them on yet. So we're going to start in PEI and cover every other province as well as the Northwest Territories. What I tried to do with each of the provinces is try to find someone, because many of the provinces, obviously I have interviewed several people from those provinces, but find somebody who perhaps captures either a seminal issue from that particular province or something that I know is true in multiple provinces, but perhaps they have a specific and really innovative way that they are addressing that. So again, from that work to individual conversations about leadership, I think it's a really good episode. I'm excited for it. And I hope you are too. And I hope what it does also is two things. One, it encourages you to listen to full episodes. Secondly, and then to subscribe. I'm always asking people to subscribe just because it's easier for you to get all the stuff. And that doesn't mean you have to listen to every single episode. It just means that you have access to it in a bit of an easier way. And the third thing is that you find somebody in this podcast that you would want to reach out to and say, I'd love to learn more. And you can either do that on your own if you want me to make an introduction to you happy to do that as well. All of these people are very generous with their time and they want to help. They're not there just for themselves. They're not there just for their district. They're there for the good of kids and for good of educators across Canada. So hope you enjoy my 50th episode of the Canadian Ed Leadership Show. start off on the very, almost the very east coast of Canada and Prince Edward Island with Tracy Bolo, the director at, in um, public schools branch of Prince Edward Island. What I notice many of our leaders are, are very conscious of is the, the ability that they have and the need that they have is to build a good team around them. And Tracy's comment here, I think, is very telling. And she was in a position, just a little context, where she was in an assistant role and then took on the interim position. And the first time I spoke with her, she was in the middle of deciding whether or not she was actually going to take this position. It was offered to her, but she hadn't decided yet whether she wanted. It. And so she was in a very good position to be able to set her terms. And her terms, as you hear in her clip, was that if we're not doing this together, we're not doing this at all. I was only interested if I knew we were going to work together as a team and go forward as a team because as an individual, you can't make an impact. And I, I look at it that way and say, if I can't offer anything that may make an impact, then I'm going to lead from where I am as opposed to putting myself out a little bit more. People wouldn't know this about me, but I'm a little bit shy to have myself out there in front of that big of an audience, I, I like to bleed from the side or, or behind and let other people shine. And I knew stepping into this role, I would probably be more of a public face than I had been in my other roles. So that was a little bit of a, a challenge yeah. for me to get past as well. Whether people say this explicitly or not, I think that this makes so many of our schools and school districts as powerful as they are is because the leadership immediately acknowledges that this is only going to work if we surround ourselves with lots of other good people. And that's the feeling I get in so many districts where they are thriving, where they're doing well, is people feel a sense of autonomy. People feel a sense of team and a sense of vision. Easy to say, but uh, not always easy to accomplish. Moving west to Nova Scotia, 
we come to the province who has had certainly, I think, the most disruption to their education system with the disbandment of school boards. So what does that mean? How does that work? Some, a couple of good conversations with a couple of executive directors. This is Steve Gallagher from Halifax talking about how the public is supported and who advocates for parents, if not for school boards. In the past, the cheat out for, for families, the public and so on were elected board members around education issues. Today in Nova Scotia, it's our MLAs. And I have regular conversations with MLAs. I had a text from an MLA last night around midnight about a concern. We were back and forth before 7 a.m. this morning. And that's, MLAs have replaced elected board members in terms of those issues, but their frame and their scope is different because an elected board member is exclusively focused on education and an MLA is a whole host of other issues that they're concerned about. So they don't necessarily have the time to spend, to dig into an issue with me and wrestle with what might have caused a decision. So the conversations are different, but I have to say they're very good. They're very good. I'm really lucky that the MLAs I work closely with here in the city, and there's, there's I don't know what I, the number might be 12 or 15, really great to work with. And they also bring a broader understanding of how government works, how it won't work. And so sometimes conversations and issues, there's a shorthand to it that wouldn't necessarily be in place with folks who are coming to be elected to a to governing board in, in a school system. There might be their first experience with it, or they're very focused on a particular issue in education. And MLAs are the ultimate generalists. And so they have a broader perspective to share and they work within. So it's hard to compare it. It's apples to oranges in some respects. I often get asked by colleagues across the country, which is better. And I can't say with confidence, which is better. Our current system has a lot of detractors and families will say a level of democracy has disappeared and there's not enough voice for families. I respect that perspective, certainly. Um, but the MLAs do a very good job of getting involved in issues and working to get them to successful conclusion. So you can see that that's what the transition is like in Nova Scotia. This is a complicated issue and there are pros and cons on both sides of it. It will just be interesting to track how this works and what how they've overcome some of the challenges in Nova Scotia that they're having with parent engagement at the time. But I know they're working towards some solutions. So let's let's keep tabs on what's happening in Nova Scotia around this particular issue. Our final stop in the Maritimes is in New Brunswick where I speak with Randy McLean, who is the superintendent at Anglophone East in Moncton. Randy really talks about an issue, again, that's pretty universal across Canada. It's across probably the United States, all around the world, is recruitment and retention and what they are doing as a district to try to get ahead of this and somehow solve. We're faced with the same reality as every other employer in North America right now. It's going to be labor force. It's going to be labor force. And for us, not only is it labor force, but it's also at the rate we are growing. It's not only maintaining, but adding. Hey. Sharing that we have top quality teachers, top quality educational assistants, top quality bus drivers, top quality. So we have, we've yeah. torqued and looking at recruitment and not only the recruitment piece, but the retention piece. Mm -hmm. And not only the retention piece, but the support piece. So we've layered on, we've had to do things that traditionally we haven't had to do, is looking at how do we recruit people into our system, looking at our system itself and making sure we're a representative workforce, and how do we recruit from all areas of our community and all areas of the country. At the same time, not only is getting people in the door, is making sure they stay. Right. So how do we layer in support? We've created a program this year for a support program for new principals and new teachers. That's a support as growth and support program. I have a teach a principal, I a con to do that work. And he has uh, three consultants who work with him uh, that are doing that work. At the same time, we're looking at human resources through a different lens. At the same time, we've begun training our own bus drivers. We're onboarding, we are onboarding 14 new bus drivers, the same part we're supporting educational assistants and onboarding educational assistants and school secretaries and school administrative assistants. Labor force is going to be access and onboarding labor force. But the most equally as powerful and important 
is ensuring we have an ongoing professional development model that supports people when they come into the system. It's not as simple as giving them people a set of keys and say, right. go forth and teach and forth and drive a bus. How do we ensure not only do we get people in the door, but how do we support them while they're here to ensure ongoing growth that we get the best people and we support people all throughout their professional journey? That's, it's an amazing, it's, excuse me, is it a challenge? Sure. But it's also an opportunity for a system of our size to be able to uh, reinvent itself in a really cool way. Yeah. So if you listen to all my podcasts, you'll hear a little bit of this from everybody in some way, shape or form. So this is not, and this is a relatively new issue. For those of you that don't follow education, we were not talking recruitment and retention. I don't know, even 10 years ago was not part of the conversation. In fact, we were trying to figure out how we can ensure that young people who go into the profession have a job. That's not the case anymore. We're trying to recruit them. So that's a big shift over the last 10 years and, and one that I hope we can work to resolve in some way. French immersion is always a pretty hot topic in terms of recruiting teachers to, to teach, as well as being able to offer enough of that. It's, it's usually in very high demand. Uh, people see um, being able to speak French as being uh, an advantage that they're going to have in the future. And I think it certainly is. What is interesting, though, is that in the province of Quebec, it, that can almost be reversed. And there's some different nuances and challenges that come, especially if you're teaching in an English board in the province of Quebec. And as we hit Quebec, Cindy Finn is one of my favorite people who shares a little bit about some of the challenges that she faces in an English board in a French-speaking province. We talk a lot about the French language and protecting the French language in Quebec. And so there is a difference between being having French instruction and feeling proficient to work and live in French. And that is, again, depending on which area of the province you find yourself, there can be limited opportunities to live and work in French. Although our students graduate with a high degree of French proficiency based on exam results and courses and all of that, we do hear from some of our students that they have a little insecurity. They lack confidence because they feel people hear that their accent may not be perfect or that they may not have the jargon in the field in which they're working right. or studying. And so there's a little bit of work to do to give students some confidence. And right now there's a big push in our province to really emphasize French being the primary language, which again, we recognize French is important in Quebec, but in larger North America and in the world, having a very good knowledge of English is also equipping them with opportunities. Ontario being our biggest province always gets a lot of attention, especially around education. Over the years, they've had quite a great reputation really for education worldwide, I think largely due to some of the work they did with Michael Fullen and the PISA scores as a result brought a lot of prominence to Ontario. Those things don't typically impress me, uh, although what I will say is again, getting to know very specifically how school boards in Ontario work and how the leadership really takes advantage of, of some of those accolades to, to further things. Tom D'Amico is one of my very favorite uh, leaders in, in the country, especially his uh, passion and interest in technology over the years. I, I knew him before his current tenure as director when he was superintendent in charge of technology and, and a lot of the things he does then. What I appreciate most about Tom is his thoughtfulness in thinking about technology always through the lens of learning and what does it matter for our students? We were the first district in the, in the province to move away from traditional libraries to learning commons. And that was significant because we stopped seeing mm -hmm. libraries as a repository of books and instead said, that's right. Create this as a space for collaboration and communication and technology. In addition to high level interest reading of books. And that set the frame for us, for our board, which I think I'm probably, we're, we're probably most proud of is the, the implementation of deep learning framework uh, with Michael Holland. That really set us up well for intentionally focusing on global competencies. Even though the province was not looking at things like collaboration, communication, creativity, they were interested in homework completion and organizational skills. We really looked at that uh, change to a focus on competency, and, and that's been really important to us. And as well, I'd say I'm proud of the fact that we've created a culture and a mindset uh, that focuses on the humane use of technology. 
we're really positioned well to embrace things like AI while our teaching staff and our, our students recognize the potential risks if technology is not used in the right way. So I would say that innovation has allowed us to be curious, to try and create, do things that uh, would allow us to explore. And even if we met with some failure, that was okay because we were working towards innovative practices and that culture exists today. We've been able to have succession planning and create that, uh, instill that in our leaders so that they know that we want to be iterative as a board and always have continuous growth. And to do that, you need to be innovative. We've had the privilege this year of working closely with Ottawa Catholic around their work in generative AI and so impressed with not just the way they embrace things, because sometimes people get the impression that, you know, with the generative AI too, it's, it's, it can be seen as the shiny new tool. They and we have had the most richest conversations that explore the real challenges that we are going to face and we are facing already, but they just aren't afraid to tackle them in that kind of thoughtful way. So once again, great leadership from Tom D'Amico and all his team in Ottawa Catholic. This episode is brought to you by Advanced Learning Partnerships, also known as ALP. We are a professional learning consulting group that serves communities across North America. We are partners, designers, and agents for change. You can learn about more about the work we do at alplearn.com. And now back to the show. So some of you may or may not know, back a number of years ago, I wrote a book about joy, embracing a culture of joy, was the title. And I've had the fortunate privilege of speaking about it. I talk about it a lot. I'm associated by uh, a lot of my peers and colleagues with that term. And listen, I embrace that totally. What I find interesting, though, is that it's not a word that I hear leaders use a lot. I'd like to hear them use that word. I hear them use the word innovative. I hear them use the word, use, use other ideas around things that probably lend themselves more to an academic kind of term. So when someone does, my ears perk up and I have known Matt Henderson for a long time, but I was so enthused when we had our conversation and he talked about love and he talked about joy as being foundational for Winnipeg School Division, of which he is a brand new superintendent slash CEO. School divisions and systems are very different and leadership in those, those ecosystems are different than say RBC or Air Canada, or not to say that those aren't fantastic organizations, but it's different. I have a friend, uh, Carlos Marino from Big Picture Learning, who always talks about leadership in, in school systems as different because we're, as leaders, we're trying to distribute power and justice to people uh, who have been marginalized and where that's been taken away. And so part of that work has to be founded on love. And when we talk about love, when I talk about love in Winnipeg School Division, it's about making sure that people, when they come into a building or when they come into community, that they feel welcome, that they feel that they're honored, that they feel that they're listened to, that they're heard, that they're seen, that people know them by name. I always talk to our staff about, we should feel that we want to leap out of bed because we're loved and we want to love everybody, especially kids, but each other as adults. And how is it that we do something as intimate as wanting to transform lives, which I think is what public education is all about. We're in the business of creating the conditions for people to discover what it means to be human in the universe and to become really good people. And we can argue about what that means, but you can't do that without love. And so I'm, I'm always telling people, I love, I have deep love for you because of the work you do for kids. In the same way, I, I would do that with my own parents. Like I, I, tell, I tell my kids that I love them all the time because I've got them and, and I think about them and I'm concerned about them and I have high expectations for them. And so that's where like we can't get into school improvement or improving our classroom practice, or, or even creating meaningful budgets, which is an ideological sure. document and process without fundamentally saying that we love the people that we serve. And so that's part of it. The second part around joy, these two things, like we want to have a blast. Like we want schools to be joyful places where we hear shrieks of joy uh, from kids and adults, sure. where sometimes things will be frustrating, no, no doubt. But at the end of the day, we want to be leaping out of bed saying, I can't wait to get to work because I'm, going to, I'm engaged in this type of fulsome activity with these kids and I'm communi in communion with these folks. I was fired up after our conversation. You often see 
in sports, a coach gives a very inspirational speech and it's, yeah, I can run through a brick wall. I felt like I could run through a brick wall for Matt and for Winnipeg School Division after our conversation. I would encourage you to listen to the whole thing. Continuing our journey west, we reach my home province, Saskatchewan. And who better to represent leadership in Canadian education, especially leadership in emerging technologies, than my good friend, Dr. Alec Koros. And so I had Alec on the show. We talked about a lot of things, but he also, we also sort of focused that conversation on the future of generative AI. Alec is, I would argue the foremost leader in Canada as far as uh, education and generative AI and Alex shares his thoughts. We did talk a lot about some of the negative thing, but this little clip is about maybe the possibilities. But if we really take up the idea that this, again, it's never going to be 100% mature. You're always going to need a human pilot of some sort to, to run these things. And, and if we learn those skills and the way that we use these sort of transhumanist technologies in the classroom and in learning environments and in training, then, then I think we can see the full potential of the tools, first of all, but also see that they're never going to replace humans. And even if they pretend to be sentient, they'll never be sentient. They'll never have true to human compassion and feeling, and they won't, won't necessarily understand ethics and morality. When it comes to some of the decision-making pieces, they can, they can create some great copy and some really convincing literature and answers to problems. But at the same time, ultimately we have to implement those, those issues or those, the solutions, the problems we have to be co-piloting or piloting these uh, tools to really get the full benefit of them. And otherwise we're, we're definitely headed down the wrong path. So one more thing to add, I feel quite guilty, if you will, in that in all of the guests I have, Alec is the only one from my home province of Saskatchewan. So if you're out there listening, Saskatchewan listeners, and you are or know of a Canadian leader, a Saskatchewan education leader that I should have, send me a line and, and we'll get that. We'll get that going soon. One of the big topics in education today is wellness and well-being, which started, I let me argue, it would start in Ontario. Ontario was the first province to put student well-being as part of their provincial goals to seek and people followed up from there. But what has emerged in the, I'd say the last five years, maybe a little bit more, is the fact that doesn't work unless we have teachers who are well. And so workplace wellness and well-being is now something that School divisions, school districts are paying a lot of attention to, and no one is really doing this better, in my opinion, than in the province of Alberta. And within the province of Alberta, I point to Elk Island Catholic Schools, Paul Corrigan and his team, who <laughs> they are very critical of their own work because they just realize how important it is and how much more there is to do. I've not met another district that are as actively talking about it acknowledging where they've not done well. And yet at the same time, they are probably doing more than most. My whole episode with Paul was so delightful in his candor and his vulnerability to say, we've got a lot of stuff wrong. And in this particular clip, specifically talking about the wellness challenge, and I think uncovering a whole other part of this conversation is the challenge of well-being with our leaders. One of the things that has came out from our dashboard data, from our data, is you look at the subgroups of staff, and as you move up from teachers, say, to vice principals, to a leadership position, vice principals, their wellness data is lower than teachers as a group. And the, the least, the lowest wellness data, especially in terms of relationships, it, are our principals. In, in the division. And so again, as you mentioned before, this is not great data. Like it doesn't make us feel good or look good, um, but you have to deal with it. And so then what are we doing to create support networks for principals who are navigating changing relationships in their own school and often feel isolated and alone? The data is clear for us. It's in front of us. And now we have an obligation to try as a system to figure out what to do with it. 
So I want to, again, pause and highlight that clip, get you to listen to the whole thing, Paul Corgan's episode, because I'm challenging you schools and school leaders to do more than you are with well-being and do more than you are with supporting your leaders in their workplace well-being. And because we know if we get that, if we can get that, we have what we need then to really do a great job with teacher being and for sure with our students as well. So let's not forget our leaders. Let's spend a little bit more time, focus on them the way that um, our friends in Elk Island are doing. If you've been following along in your map, we started in Prince Edward Island and we have been slowly moving west across all of the provinces. And we're going to take a slight, I don't know if it's a detour, we're just going to head north for a moment before we finish off and visit Yellowknife Catholic schools in Yellowknife, Northwest Territories, where we talk to Simone Gessler. Simone is a longtime educator in that in that part of the country. And I've been really blessed to get to know a number of folks leading schools in the northern part of Canada and just trying to uh, squash my ignorance, if you will. But Simone is doing something that I honestly, I don't know that many districts are doing it the way that she is. So they are building a vision of a learner, which exists in some parts and some uh, jurisdictions in Canada, it, but it's just not nearly as emphasized as it is, particularly in the U.S. But the way in which Simone and the language that they use makes this thing come alive. And so whether you're talking about strategic visions or other kind of visionary documents, oftentimes they are dry or they just have a language that is very difficult to really truly embrace. But Simone wanted something different. So I get her to share a little bit about the language that they use and why it's so important to them as a school district. I'd love to know more about just even that language. Like I, the, the building relationships one in particular, I think fascinates me because mm -hmm. what I see in others that are probably a lot similar ideas is even community, which is a, a better term than what I've even seen others use, but like actually t using the phrase building relationships as a priority. Mm -hmm. I'd love mm -hmm. to know even about how you get there. Yeah. So then that's the hard part, right? Because it's easy to say we're going to build relationships, but what do we mean by that? So then we really dug into what would students be doing and demonstrating we're using that, not we are using that observable impact model. What are students doing and demonstrating? What are educators doing and demonstrating? And what are the activities and assessments that we're using in order to bring that forward? And so then we can really see evidence of building relationship in classrooms. And to just, you talked about that sort of corporate speak. One of the things we said right out of the gates is we don't want any edgy speak. We don't want any buzzwords. We want real terminology that everybody understands what we're talking about. So that was a goal of ours. Yeah. So we talk about sharing your, the aspects of your identity in multiple ways. That's how you build relationship. By being right. able to say, this is who I am, this is my identity, and be able to share that in a multiple different, in multiple different ways. So then if that's the case, then educators are designing, implementing, and modeling activities that allow students to demonstrate that identity. So really digging into what is, what's the actions, and then what are some activities, and that really aligns with some of the work that we're doing around what is our best self showing up as our best self. So that's language that our students can use. They understand because we talk about what is best self. So we tie that back to our vision of a learner and what are the characteristics and skills that we want our students to walk away with. So I think the vision of a learner isn't necessarily a new concept, right? No. Lots of people have vision of learning or vision of a graduate. But what we wanted to do is really talk about how do we get there? And what are those three important things? We end our journey in the beautiful province of British Columbia. It's no secret that I have a very strong affiliation and love for that province, not just because it's a very beautiful province, but in education in particular, I just know so many tremendous leaders. I think as a province, collectively, they really are the best at, I would say, collaboration and have a really healthy sense of who they are, the pride that they might take, but also their curiosity and desire to grow and learn more. So I had a hard time choosing of all the great 
conversations I've had with BC leaders. I, I decided to share with you a little bit of a, an extended part, a clip, if you will, with Mark Paramang. Mark is, of all of the people that I interviewed, probably the person that I knew the least going in, um, but I've really come to appreciate his approach, especially a, from a large school district. Mark is extremely personable and approachable. He works at making things feel small and feel very personal, which is hard to do. It is not easy to do when you are leading 80 plus thousand students and, and adults. It's, that's not easy to do. He does a great job. And he talked about the having fun as a leader. So I wanted to end with this clip of Mark Paramang talking about how leadership is fun. I rarely, if ever, heard anybody say leadership is fun. I'm glad you said that, though. And honestly, we're sometimes in education, we're so scared of using fun because it doesn't sound academic. It doesn't sound it doesn't sound as insightful as it is. But why can't it be like, why can't it just be? Like, it's fun? It is fun. I got Tuesday. I had fun like that whole day of working with all the leaders across Metro Van and watching people engage, having conversations. Yep. Some tough ones, like really, ooh, that's really, you can have fun in the midst of the struggle, in the midst of the complexities. That can be like, I love Malcolm Gladwell has a quote that says, ideas and dissonance should bring you joy. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, this is interesting. Let's talk more about that. Somewhere along the line there, Mark, you have developed a healthy combination of self-awareness, but also perspective that enables you to do that. Because I think that's where I think leadership has failed in terms of recruiting new leaders because, but it presented themselves as this is too hard for me to do. And I can't like, I'm not, I'm struggling. Right. And, and I, listen, I empathize with it. I, I don't want to say it's, it's not that way, but I don't know if it's mindset shift or what it is, but I'm curious, like, how do you, how do we get there? That place where you can actually use the phrase leadership is fun. I think it's part of it when people ask us how it's going, right? How's it going? Probably the initial reaction is, oh boy, <laughs> let, me, let me tell you what I got to deal with now. Super right? busy. Super busy. Right? <laughs> uh, I think part of it is just actually us changing the description of what we do. And I'd actually say that for the entire education system. I think in many times we always talk about what needs to be worked on and looked at, and we need to continue to talk about that, but we also need to acknowledge that, and it's a really good system and kids are actually having amazing experiences every single day. And it's not to suggest that all kids are, because not all kids are, and that's what we're working on. But let's also acknowledge the great work that folks are doing and the system's doing. So that would be number one. But I guess, like, I'm a big skier, Dean. Like, I really love to ski. I've skied since I was a, a, a very young kid. And, so, you know, when I go up on the mountain and I'm on a very steep, tight pitch, let's say, or, or run, and I'm at the top of that thing, so there's going to be a little bit of fear, right? And then you're going to get into the actual run and you're going to start to ski it. And it's going to get hard because your legs are going to burn and your quads are killing you, but you can't really stop because it's too narrow. So you got to push all the way through. So then it's taxing. I'm breathing heavy. But when I push through and I get to the bottom and I stop, I realize A, I accomplished something and B, that was a lot of fun. And I just think it's the mindset of actually taking a look at whatever it is. It doesn't matter if it's changing a school growth plan or working with a, uh, you know, a challenging student who's just not thriving or working with parents that are disagreeing with the decision. It's at that end moment when you get to the conclusion um, and you've made that breakthrough, you know, in the end, that is a fun experience. It is hard. It's taxing. It's tiring and all the rest of it, but you've made a change and you've learned. And I just think that piece for us is, and it was fun because the next time through, I know I can do it. I'm going to push maybe a little bit harder in this zone and maybe I'll throw in a, a little hop off a cliff just for fun. See if I can land it. There you go. I really am pleased to be able to put this clip show highlight show together for you. I think it really does capture the essence of Canadian education, some of the nuances that are true of particular provinces, and really just all of the great people. If you listen to this and you found this valuable, first of all, and if you made it all the way through, 
Could you leave a comment somewhere, a thumbs up somewhere just to indicate that this uh, kind of a show was valuable for you? I really think if you are a Canadian leader, that if there should be at least one person in all of these that you make a point of reaching out to. They're all very accessible. They're all very happy to engage whomever wants to explore some of their ideas further because I think that's part of the, the goal of the show is to connect those leaders across Canada. Anyways, thanks for listening and appreciate your support always. Mm -hmm.